Hey folks, I just wanted to go over the answers to unit uh, four, which was momentum and energy. And uh, so we had our 15 open response, so let's just dig in. Um, so first question was, uh, Zenochara uh, has a record for the fastest slap shot at 48.63 meters per second. So this guy is an active NHL player uh, for, I think he's still playing for the Boston Bruins, Boo Bruins. Uh, anyways, the hockey puck has a mass of 0.17 kilograms. What is the momentum of Chara's slap shot? Uh, so if we remember uh, to get our variables down, we're trying to find momentum, which is rho, which is mass times velocity. So they gave us our mass, which is pretty small, 0.17 kilograms, and our velocity here at 48.63 meters per second. And so if we multiply those out together, we get 8.27 kilograms meters per second. Now remember, there's nothing fancy with the way that we're doing units for momentum. We're just combining the kilograms from mass and the meters per second from velocity. All right, so that's number one. Straightforward, pretty easy. Number two uh, got a little more complicated. So we have two objects here. We have a compact car, which I just said, you know what, I'm going to use it as CC for compact car and then LC for larger car. It just helped me, you know, make sure I'm not mixing up numbers here and there. So let's look at the situation. Number two, a compact car with a mass of 725 kilograms is moving at 13 meters per second. So that's what I got. Mass of 725 kilograms for compact and 13 meters per second velocity for the compact car. Now they're asking how fast would a larger car with a mass of 2,175 kilograms be going if it had the same momentum. So we want to set their momentums equal to each other, but we want a new velocity for this larger car. So we don't have the momentum for the compact car, but we can figure that out. Now we do have the mass for the larger car. We're looking for the velocity of the larger car, and we don't have the momentum for the large car. So here we got some equations. So the momentum equals mass times velocity. This is the compact car. Momentum equals mass velocity for the large car. But we know that they have to have the same momentum. So if they had the same momentum, so the compact car and the large car should have the same momentum. So we're just going to substitute in this stuff over here for compact car down here. And we're just going to substitute our equation for the large car's momentum on this side. And all we really need to find is the velocity of the large car. So we can divide out our mass for the large car divided by the momentum for the compact car. And so it comes out velocity of the large car, and this is our equation, mass times velocity compact divided by the mass of the large car. And we're gonna take our 725, multiply it by 13, divide it by our mass, which is much bigger. And look at that, 4.33 meters per second, which is much smaller than the 13 meters per second, but that's because it had a much larger mass, so it had to compensate. So that's number two, 4.33, meters per second. Large car, compact car. Now three, four, and five had to do with the situation where there's someone driving in a vehicle and unfortunately they have a collision with a telephone pole. So let's read the situation here. Uh, we have a 58 kilogram person and they're driving a car at a highway speed of 22 meters per second. Now they collide with a telephone pole and bounce backwards at four meters per second. All right, so unfortunately there's an accident. Uh, we do know that the collision with the seatbelt and the airbags lasts for 0.24 seconds. So less than a second, a lot of things happen. People design cars specifically for these kind of situations to make sure that folks are safe. Let's figure out some information here. Now, number three, determine the impulse felt by the driver. All right, well, we said that impulse is just the change in momentum. And the only thing you can change in momentum is really the velocity. And so we have our initial velocity of 22 meters per second. They said, hey, you bounce backwards at four meters per second. So that's why we have to have a negative four for our final velocity. And remember the change in velocity is gonna be final velocity minus initial velocity. So our final again is negative four, that's why it's in front, minus our 22, because that was our original velocity. And we're just gonna keep the 58 kilograms for the person. So you notice this number is going to come out negative, which makes sense because they're going in the opposite direction now once they go backwards at four meters per second. So 
the impulse is going to be negative 1,508 kilograms meters per second. So that would be question number three. That's their impulse. Now the next part says, well, what's the force that the driver felt during that situation? We do know that change in momentum, which is impulse, equals force multiplied by time. Now they did give us time up here. We do know our time is 0.24 seconds, so I rewrote it for myself right there. And I know that my change in momentum is the same equation I had from question number three. So mass is final velocity minus initial velocity over time. I just rewrote the numbers in here, but you could have actually left this number in your calculator. And all we have to do is just divide by the amount of time that that driver experienced the seat belt and the air airbag being deployed. And so we divide that by the time and the force that they felt was negative 6,283.33 newtons. Decent amount of force there, all right? Now for question number five, Here's a situation they're saying if they're not wearing a seatbelt, all right? So the point of a seatbelt is that it increases your time because look, the person is brought to arrest when they were not wearing their seatbelt and the time is much smaller, 0 0.018 seconds. They want us to figure out what's the force felt. So once again, we have our change in momentum. So I'm using the same variables as before for my impulse. So 58 times negative four minus two. But now my time is much different. It's 0 0.018 when before it was just 0.24 seconds. So this is actually much smaller, all right? So this is happening a lot faster. Actually, the seatbelt slows you down, increasing your time, which actually decreases your force because look how much force there is now if they weren't wearing their seatbelt. A negative 83,707.78 newtons, drastically bigger, and right? obviously much more unsafe if you're having more force impact in your body. So that was question five, the whole situation dealing with someone in their car wearing a seatbelt and not wearing a seatbelt, hopefully conveying the idea that it's much safer because there's less force imposed on your body. Question number six, uh, we got some folks that are curling, most likely Canadians or Scottish people. That's where curling actually started up in Scotland or over in Scotland, I should say. So let's take a look at this situation. We've got a curling rock, all right? Just actually what the Scottish used to do is they just would go out in the middle of winter on a frozen pond and take rocks and slide them across the ice. That's how curling got started. There's special rocks that they actually use from a specific island off of Scotland. And that's what the Olympic Committee uh, designates as the type of rock that needs to come uh, to be made for the curling rocks. Side note, back to the question. We have our mass for the curling rock, and we know it's sliding along at 6.4 meters per second. So here we go. Mass one, which I said was a curling rock, 7.2 kilograms, got it there. And our velocity, which is 6.4 meters per second. All right, oop, I should change that. Meters per second. Uh, and it collides with something that's stationary, which means it has zero velocity. And so I put that there, a 4.8 kilogram bucket of sand. So there's our mass, all right? So that's kind of maybe you can think of that as the target. Now, after the collision, the curling rock is still traveling forward at 1.28 meters per second. So here's my uh, curling rock, M1. I'm designating M1 as my curling rock. It's got a new velocity. So I said, all right, it's now going 1.28 instead of 6.4. What they want us to figure out is how fast the sand is moving after the collision. So M2, I said, was the sand bucket. And so V4 is its new velocity after the collision. We don't know that. Now, one thing that's helpful here is that the sand bucket is not moving in the beginning or before the collision. So this entire portion is zero. We don't have to worry about it in our equation. Now, what we really wanna do is get V4 by itself. So what am I gonna do? I can subtract over M1 and V3. And I can also divide out by M2. Now, if I do M1 V1 minus M1 V3, I can see that I have M1 and I just factor out the M. I got my velocity uh, one before the collision minus velocity three after the collision. Why am I subtracting? Because this is being added to this. So I need to subtract opposite. And then I'm gonna divide out my M2 because those are being multiplied. So opposite of multiplications, division. There we go, V4. 
And so here's my equation. I'll just plug in my numbers. So my mass one, which I got from here, which I got from above, my initial velocity, which was 6.4, my final, which was 1.8, which they told me from up here. And I know the mass of the bucket right there, so 4.8. And if I do everything right, I know that the sand bucket after the collision is going 7.68 meters per second. So that's an example of a collision. It's actually an elastic collision because they bounced off and they're separate afterwards, just like they were separate before. So there we go, question number six, 7.68 meters per second. And that was really the conservation of momentum. Question number seven. Well, we got a situation here, folks. We got a runaway train that's going down the track. Now this train's got a very big amount of mass. So the mass is 13,500 kilograms. So I designated that runaway train car as M1. And it's going down at 12.5 meters per second. All right, so there's my V1. Now it collides with a stationary caboose. So that, in case you don't know what a caboose is, it's the end of a train, all right? Um, and it actually used to be kind of like a brake car to help out. Now that mass is actually much smaller. It's only 12,100 kilograms. So it is stationary, so its velocity, all right, beforehand is going to be zero, all right? So stationary means at rest, which means zero velocity. Now, after the collision, they stick together. So that's why I'm adding both of these masses. And that would be an inelastic collision. When you see stick together, that's inelastic collision. What the question's asking, though, is what's the final velocity of these two cars? Well, they're going to have the same velocity, so that's why I'm adding these two together because they've stuck together. Now, again, something that's nice is I can eliminate this portion of the equation because it's zero, and zero times anything is zero. So what I'm going to try to do is find my velocity three. Well, I'm going to take everything in this parentheses and divide it, this side and that side. So M1, V1 is the only thing left over because, remember, we eliminated that because we have a zero. And divide by the total mass of everything. If we've done our calculations correct, we come out to 6.59 meters per second. So this is another example of the conservation momentum. And uh, but this type of collision is going to be an inelastic collision uh, because that's the kind that they actually stick together. All right. So something that we took down on our notes, um, but hopefully it's just getting a little more ingrained in our brains. All right. Question number seven. There we go. Question eight was, was a pretty involved question. Um, it was actually a reverse collision because if we look at the before, they're together. But if we look at the after, they're apart, they're separated, all right? So here's what's gonna happen. We know that we have this rocket ship and its total mass is gonna be 2000 kilograms. Now, what I'm gonna say is that M2 is the rocket ship and M1 is the fuel section. So they tell me that a rocket ship and its fuel section have a combined mass of 2000 kilograms. Boom, there we go. They're telling me that it's also traveling at 120 meters per second. All right, now they say that it detaches from the fuel section. The rocket ship now has a momentum of 145,500 kilograms meters per second. So I know the momentum of my rocket ship and I know the velocity tell me also it's traveling at 97 meters per second. What I don't know is the mass for the fuel section or the velocity for the fuel section. There's something else that I really also should try to find out. I don't know the mass of the rocket section, but I do know the momentum and the velocity. And so we've seen before that mass and velocity equal momentum. So I'll be able to figure that out later on. Now, as I said, this is a reverse uh, collision. So an explosion can be thought of a reverse collision. Things are starting out as one and then they're ending up as multiple parts. Whereas in the previous question, we had multiple parts, two different uh, railway cars, and then they collided and stuck together. So this is opposite. So we're starting together and ending apart. So that's why I have the two objects, M1 and M2, I'm adding them together inside my parentheses and I have my initial velocity, which they told me was 120. Now afterwards, all right, equals, we have our uh, M1 and V2, which is gonna be my fuel section, and M2 V3, which is my rocket ship part. Now we know that 
mass times velocity is going to be the momentum. And they already gave us the momentum. They actually told us that answer part right there. So I'm doing rho, which is momentum, and two means mass two, and F means final. So mass times velocity is final momentum for the second object. So I just substitute that in because I already know the number there. And instead of rewriting all that, I've got it in here. So we're going to keep everything the same in the front. But you know what? We also know that mass two, all right, if we rearrange this equation, we can figure out how much mass is in the second object. And that's going to be momentum divided by velocity. Well, guess what? They gave us both of those right here. They told us what the momentum was after the collision or after the explosion, I should say, and the velocity after the explosion. So if I divide the momentum by velocity, I can figure out the mass of this little section. And I'll show you how that's important in a second. Now, in the beginning, they told us that the mass was 2,000 kilograms. But if you add M1 plus M2, you'll get the total mass. So M1 equals, I'm sorry, mass total equals the mass of the first object plus the mass of the second object. But I want to really figure out what's the mass of the first object because we already figured out the mass of the second object. So here we go. Mass 1 equals the total mass minus the second mass. And I do know what the second mass is. I have momentum divided by velocity. So I'm really going to input this little expression down here for M2. And that's what I have at the bottom. So wherever it says M1 now, I'm going to then substitute in mass total minus Momentum divided by velocity for the second object, which gives me the mass of that object. And so that's what I have right here. And that's how I got this expression. I'm still going to try to find my velocity. All right. I'm looking for that. And I also know the total momentum. They gave it to me. I don't got to worry about that number. And M1 plus M2, we said, is the total. And they already gave me the total. So I can just use this number later in the equation. So instead of writing M2 plus M1 over and over again, I'm just writing mass total. So here we go. We got a really big equation right here. Really what we're trying to find is velocity two. So I want to get everything over to this side, to the left side, except for this velocity. All right, well, I'm adding the momentum of the second object, its final momentum, so now I'll subtract it. That's how I got this. And I really need to divide out this whole expression inside the parentheses because it's being multiplied by velocity two. And so op obviously opposite of multiplication is division. So that's why it's in the denominator here. And so what I really need to think about is where do all these variables come from? Well, that's why I label them up top here. I've got my mass total. I've got my velocity initial. I've got my momentum final for the second object. I got my velocity of the first of the second object after the collision. And those are my variables that I'm looking for. And so if I can line that up correctly, Apologize. So if I can line this all the numbers up correctly, all right, I did a little typo here. I forgot the five, um, but I went back and make sure the calculations were correct. The mass, or I should say the velocity of the fuel section is 189 meters per second. And it came out to exactly 189 meters per second. No decimals there. All right. Um, actually looking back at this diagram, uh, you may say, well, wait a minute, if this one's going 97 and this one's going 189, that means this one's going faster and should bump into this. That is true. However, I just drew these backwards. I should probably have the rocket ship here and the fuel section here so it could go forward more without bumping into anything. So anyways, this is a very uh, complex problem. This is probably the cream of the crop that we're going to see for this unit uh, in regards to momentum. There's a lot of substitutions. And uh, so this is a very challenging one, but if you got it, congratulations. The answer was 189 meters per second. Again, a conservation of momentum, and it was an explosion, which we can think of as just a reverse collision. Let's move on to number nine. Number nine was much more straightforward. All right, kind of quick shot here. So we're talking about a 65 kilogram hiker, and they're going to the top of a mountain and that's 752 meters high. They want to know how much work is done. Well, we've talked about that work equals force times distance, but work also equals the change in energy. Now, what type of energy do we use? Well, we know we have our mass. We know we have our height. 
there's always going to be gravity, so it's going to be potential energy. So mass times gravity times the change in height. And the change of height, they just gave to us. 752 meters, we know their mass is 65 kilograms. So I'm going to take their mass, multiply it by the acceleration due to gravity, which we have on our reference sheet. We also know the height, and it comes out to a very large amount of work that that hiker had to do to get up to a really high mountain, which was 479,512.8 joules. Here's the hoping they had a big breakfast because they're going to need a lot of that energy to get to the top of the hill. They'll probably be using some energy to coast on themselves on down. So that's number nine, looking at potential energy uh, or the change of potential energy, which is equal to work. Remember, the change in energy is equal to work. Number 10 is another work problem, but we're using theta. We're using an angle here because the person is actually pushing the lawnmower and the force is 280, which is nice, but they're not pushing it in the exact same direction that the lawnmower is moving. It's 42 degrees below the horizontal. So that's why I drew this triangle for myself. So 42 degrees below the horizontal, this is actually the force here. And this would be the horizon. So my force is 280 degrees or 280 newtons. My angle is 42 degrees. And they push that lawnmower for a total of 75 meters. Pretty long yard they have for themselves there. So distance is 75 meters. They want to know what's the work. Well, we know that force times distance cosine theta will equal our work. So if we just substitute in the correct net values, it's going to be a simple shot. So again, our force is 280, which they gave to us here. Our distance is 75, which they explained to us as well. And our cosine of 42, if we put that in correctly, comes out to 15,606.04 joules. Decent amount of energy. Hopefully they had a good lunch if they're going to be doing that lawn mowing after lunchtime. So that's number 10, again, thinking about work with force times distance times cosine theta. Again, and a diagram may help you for this, all right, just because, um, I don't know, sometimes it helps people visualize what's going on. I know it does for me. Number 11, a student stomps on a rocket and the, and, and the 0.075 rocket travels 15.6 meters straight upwards. All right, so we know its mass. Its final height is going to be pretty high, 15 meters, 15.6 meters. It started at zero. We know its initial velocity, or its final velocity at the top has to be zero, because any projectile all the way at the top has a zero velocity. Therefore, its initial velocity is going to be zero. What they want us to figure, or the, I'm sorry, we're trying to find our initial velocity. So what we want to do is figure out the initial velocity. Now, beforehand, energy potential plus kinetic, that has to equal afterwards the energy potential final kinetic i should write this is final all right well the potential energy in the beginning is zero because our height is zero and kinetic energy final is going to be zero because we have a final velocity of zero so that means the kinetic energy in the beginning before right as they stomp it up is going to equal the potential energy at the end when it's at the highest point in the projectile so we have these equations. Kinetic energy is one half mv squared, initial velocity, which equals energy potential final, mass, gravity, height final, which we've written down over here. Now we can cancel out our masses because we don't need to worry about those. And so if we rearrange correctly, our initial velocity should be the square root of two times g times h. And that comes out to 17.49 meters per second. So that's a conservation of energy problem for us. Again, 11 was 17.49 meters per second. Number 12 and 13 were kind of tied together. Um, so we're looking at a car that's 1,430 kilograms. It's initially at rest, but then the engine does work of 380,000 joules of work on the car. So our work is 380,000 joules. We know our mass of 1,430 kilograms. What they want to know is if all the work's converted to kinetic energy, what's the final speed? Okay, well, we know that work equals a change in energy, and they're talking about kinetic energy, so let's use that. Now, remember, kinetic energy is one-half mv squared, mass velocity squared. But we want to do the change in kinetic energy, so velocity final minus velocity initial, but velocity initial is just zero, which is nice because they said it's at rest. So we're trying to find this final velocity. So work 
equals one half mass times velocity final squared. So I rearrange that equation. So two times work divided by mass, the square root, and our answer comes out to 23.05 meters per second. So after the car got all that energy from 380,000 joules, we're going to be going 23.05 meters per second. Now question 13 says, okay, it's reached its top velocity. Now the engine cuts off and the car just rolls up a hill. If the car continues to roll up that hill, all right, and all the kinetic energy has been converted into potential energy, they want to know how high. So what I'm going to say here is my final velocity from question 12, which my answer is right there, is going to equal my initial velocity for this question to help me answer it. So let's think about this. The before, I have zero potential energy because it hasn't gone up the ramp yet. I do have kinetic energy because it is traveling at a velocity. Now, after, all right, when it gets to the top of the ramp, it will have potential energy because it'll have height. That's what we're actually trying to find, how high up. And it'll have zero kinetic energy because they said all of its kinetic energy has been converted to potential. So there's no more kinetic. So our initial kinetic energy should equal our final potential energy. And that's what I've done here. So one half mass times velocity initial squared equals mass times gravity height final. Again, cross off your masses. You don't need to worry about those. They're equivalent to each other. And we want to rearrange everything to get height final by itself. So height final is velocity initial squared. And I said, okay, well, my velocity initial squared, my velocity initial is really my velocity final. So I'm going to use this equation to work divided by mass square root. But if you take the square root of something squared, it's just that expression itself. So 2 W. So two times work over two times mass gravity, we can cancel out the two. So it's work divided by mass gravity. And it comes out that that vehicle will travel up the ramp 27.09 meters above the horizontal. So that one was a little bit involved. Uh, the first part was, or I'm sorry, the second part was conservation of energy. And we need to know uh, the work from beforehand, which was given to us. So this is kind of like the work theorem to figure out the final uh, velocity of it. So 12 was 23.05 meters per second, while we use that velocity to figure out the total height, which was 27.09 meters. Number 14, uh, we have a 75 kilogram snowboarder and they're sliding down a frictionless rail uh, to a height of 1.75 meters high. Um, I'm sorry, they're sliding up on the rail. So they're actually moving up. And then they're going to slide across. They're still going to have a velocity of 2.5 meters per second. So they started with some kinetic energy, but they're not going to use all of their kinetic energy. They still have some left over because they have a velocity. What they want us to figure out is how much kinetic energy did they have before they slid up the rail. All right, our initial velocity, don't know it. Uh, our final velocity, we know that because they gave it to us. We know the mass. The initial height was zero because they were not up on the rail. And then they got up to the top of the rail, which is about 1.75 meters. So let's think about the beforehand. So they had no potential energy because they were on the surface on their snowboard. And they did have kinetic energy. And that's what we're actually trying to find, which equals when they got to the top of the rail, which is the after part, they do have a height. So they have some potential energy. There's our height. And we do have some kinetic energy because our final velocity has been given to us 2.5. So we really need to figure out all of our kinetic energy. That's what we're looking for. Now we have our mass times gravity times height, which is potential energy, our final height, which they gave us. And we're going to add that to our kinetic energy because they're still traveling at 2.5 meters per second. And so we can factor out our mass. So gravity times height final plus one half velocity final squared. If we do our math right, it comes out to be 1. 1,521.94 uh, joules of kinetic energy. And that's the kinetic energy before they actually went up the rail. And so all of that energy um, is now going to be stored inside of the potential energy and some of the moving energy after they're on top of the rail. So again, number 14, our final answer was 1,521.94 joules. And that was a conservation of energy type of question. And our last problem was pretty straightforward. It was a power problem, the last kind of concept we talked about during the unit. So we have a 68 kilogram student and they run up a flight of stairs that's 3.2 meters high. And they do that in 4.8 seconds. And they wanna know how much power 
is the student using when they're running up those stairs. So the power output. Now power is work divided by time, but we know that work is a change in energy. So we have a change in energy, but which type of energy? Well, we have our mass and our height. They're in a gravitational field because they're on Earth. So we can use potential energy and we're gonna still divide that by time. So mass times gravity times height. The height's gonna be our 3.2, gravity's a given and we know our mass. The time that they gave us was 4.8 seconds, so we're gonna use that in the denominator. And our final answer comes out to 444.72 watts. And that's how much uh, power that they used up when they were trying to go up those stairs in 4.8 seconds. So those are our 15 questions that we did for our unit test on momentum and energy. If you have any further questions, let me know. Uh, hopefully that cleared some things up for you. Have a good day.